forfeited because there's a statute that says, and I'll cover this later too, but there's a statute that says if the landlord, if the tenant tries to apply the last month's rent or their security deposit to last month's rent, uh, that they forfeit it and the landlord can still go after it. So, it's, but it has to be in the rental agreement. Uh, even though there's a statute, Kansas case law said that has to be in the rental agreement. But so just always advise your clients never try to apply the last month's or never try to apply their security deposit uh, to the last month's rent. They just need to pay last month's rent and hope the uh, landlord gives their security deposit back where they can file in court to get it back if the landlord doesn't. Um, so I'm not going to cover all of these again. We're, we're pressed for time today. So um, there are some terms and conditions that apply if there is no, if they're not in the rental agreement. Um, so make sure you look at those. One is that the tenant shall pay the fair rental value of the property. Um, another is that they can't, you cannot, um, you, the landlord can't include any terms that are prohibited by this act, obviously. Um, and if there's no, if it doesn't say where to pay the landlord, the place that you pay at the property. So if the, if the lease, the rental agreement doesn't say where to pay the landlord, the tenant, the, it's the landlord's responsibility to go to the property and pick up rent. Um, there are also some prohibited terms. Um, the big one is that the landlord cannot agree to, or tenant or landlord can't agree to waive or forego rights or remedies under this act. So you cannot, under a normal landlord tenant uh, situation that's not residential, you can waive any of those statutes that you want to. But if it's a residential uh, landlord, if it just falls under the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, you cannot waive those rights or remedies. Um, another big one is that you cannot put attorney fees provision in a landlord in a um, rental agreement. Um, and you can't waive liability except for some very specific things. Um, and then you'll see here, if you do violate one of those terms, the, the, the party that's um, aggrieved can get actual damages. And I highlight actual damages because throughout the Landlord Tenant Act, in several places, it uses the term actual damages. And in very few places, it actually uses the term damages. So which you could get you know, pain and suffering if it's an egregious uh, action, uh, punitive damages. And so I'll highlight that when we get to those stages. Uh, it's a joint duty of the landlord and the tenant within five days of moving in to inventory the premises. Most commonly, it's known as a move-in checklist. Uh, I always recommend that tenants uh, do a very, very detailed move-in checklist. Even if the landlord doesn't come, they should do their own, make sure that they keep a copy for themselves, most importantly, but also send a copy to the landlord. And that doesn't mean that the landlord has to fix all of those things. We'll go over the duties of the landlord in a little bit, but it's very important to have that just so that the tenant isn't charged for those things at the end of the lease. So let's say you have a cracked tile in the kitchen, right? That's not a health or safety violation. The landlord probably doesn't have to fix that under the Landlord Tenant Act, uh, but they can try to charge the tenant for that if they you know, think that that's normal wear or above normal wear and tear. And so if the tenant doesn't have that included on their move-in checklist at the beginning, uh, you can bet that the landlord is probably gonna try to charge them for that at the end of the tenancy. So even if you don't expect the landlord to fix it, just write down any problems that you see with the premises, it just makes it clear at the end of the uh, tenancy what the land or what the tenant is responsible for and what they're not responsible for. Uh, it is the landlord's duty to take a signed copy and, and and furnish a copy to the tenant. That doesn't always happen, so the tenant should just make sure that they either you know, have their own version of it or they get a copy of the from the landlord as soon as possible. Um, they don't do that. That does not preclude a landlord from filing for damages. It will make it harder for them to prove. If they can't prove what the condition of the property was before move, the tenant moved in, uh, then it's going to be difficult for them to prove that the tenant caused the damages, but they do get the opportunity to do that even if they didn't do a move-in checklist. Uh, for security deposits, Kansas law limits security deposits to one month's rent unless the property is uh, furnished, and then they can charge an, an additional half-month rent, or if they have pets, then they can charge an additional half-month rent. So it can be two months total but it can only be two months if it's furnished and if they have a pet. Uh, upon termination, the landlord is supposed to apply any damages or any rent or late fees that the tenant owes them. Uh, they send a, they're supposed to send a written notice to the tenant saying why, what, how much they're keeping. Uh, if they're not keeping anything, they should send the full amount of the security, back, back to, security deposit back to the tenant. Uh, and then they're supposed to do that within 30 days after the termination of the tenancy. Uh, they have to mail it to the tenant's last known address. So it's very important to let tenants know that they need to give the landlord a forwarding address or at the very least go to the post office and make sure that they have their mail forwarded 
because if they do not give the landlord a forwarding address, then that's going to be mailed to the property that they've already moved out of and they will never see. Uh, and then they go to court and say, oh, if they didn't give me my security deposit. The landlord says, look, I mailed it back to the property address. They didn't give me a forwarding address. Uh, and then they may be out of luck. Hopefully they would still get their security deposit back, but now they're out the cost of filing a small claims case. Uh, if the landlord doesn't do that, then the tenant can uh, recover the amount wrongfully withheld and one and a half times that amount. So later we'll cover a statute that does one and a half times. This is the amount wrongfully withheld and one and a half times. So it's two and a half times total. Uh, so it's a very favorable tenant provision. If the landlord either doesn't return the security deposit, wrongfully withholds it, or if they just fail to give that list. So if they don't give a list uh, saying why they're keeping that damages within 30 days, the tenant can sue them for that. Um, again, this, here's that statute that says the tenant cannot use the security deposit to cover any, any rent. If they do that, then they forfeit it. But that provision does have to be explicit in the rental agreement for that to apply due to Kansas case law that says that. Uh, here's the case law. Uh, and, and I kind of covered that when I was going over the statutes, but we'll send out this presentation so you can take a look at this. Uh, the landlord only has five duties under the Landlord Tenant Act. So they have to comply with building and housing codes that materially affect health and safety. So again, this is not cracked tiles, uh, missing interior. It doesn't, you know, they can be missing interior doors as long as it's not a health and safety issue. You could have cabinet doors that are missing. Uh, that stuff that the, that the tenant should try to contract for and ask and get in writing, the landlord's gonna fix those things, but it's not a material health or safety violation. So the landlord really has no responsibility under the Landlord Tenant Act to fix those things. Um, they do have to exercise uh, reasonable care of maintenance in common areas. So yeah. a, hallway, a parking lot, the landlord does have a duty to fix those things, even if it's not a material health or safety issue. Uh, so having light in the hallways, not having giant cracked areas in, in the uh, parking lots that people trip over, et cetera. Um, and then I like to highlight this. So in good and safe working order, all of the systems in the house. Uh, so electrical, plumbing, sanitary, heating, venting, and air conditioning. Uh, and so it uses the word air conditioning appliances. And so it's not, it's a, there's a question about whether appliances modifies air conditioning or whether it modifies all of those things. Does the landlord have to keep, so for example, a plumbing appliance, the toilet, right? The toilet is a plumbing appliance. It's not technically part of the plumbing. It's not pipes. Um, so my argument has always been that if the landlord supplies that, if they supply it or if they're required to supply it, the landlord has a duty to fix it. So what some landlords try to do is they'll have a refrigerator or they'll have a washer and dryer and they'll say, oh, this is as is. I'm giving you this as a courtesy. But if it breaks down, I don't have any duty to fix this. And I point to this statute and said, no, look, appliances, it, uh, uh, and a, a washer and dryer or refrigerator is an electrical appliance. Uh, so the landlord, if the landlord supplies it, they don't have to supply it, but if they do, they have the duty to maintain it in good and safe working order. Um, they also have to provide exterior trash removal. Uh, so in receptacles, so not interior trash cans, but trash so that the trash companies can haul that away. And in addition to three, they also have to supply running water and reasonable amounts of hot water at all times and reasonable heat. Uh, you'll notice that they do not include air conditioning. Uh, most of the international property maintenance codes that most cities and counties cite to, to also don't include air conditioning. Uh, so that is not a requirement in Kansas. But again, if they supply an air conditioning appliance, then they do have to maintain that in good and safe working. But if there's no air conditioning at the very beginning and there's no city code that says they have to do air conditioning, then that is actually not a duty under Kansas law, which is nuts to me, uh, but code is. Um, in some cases, the landlord and tenant can enter into a good faith agreement for the, the tenant to make these repairs, uh, but it's got to be, usually has to be a separate, it depends on how many units there are, but it usually has to be a separate transaction entered into good faith, not for the landlord to avoid their duties. Uh, so basically, if you're a plumber and you want to enter in a contract with, a, with your landlord to do plumbing work, make it a separate contract, um, and then that might be fine as long as it's not <laughs> them trying to get out of their job. Uh, in addition to the duties under Kansas statutory law, there's also the general warranty of habitability. Um, there's no not, not any great cases that say it specifically applies after the Kansas Residential Landlord Tenant Act was enacted in 1975, but there is an unpublished case saying that it does. Uh, and it cited a case, so it's clause to DeWare Enterprises. It cited Steele versus Latimer, which was enacted before uh, the Landlord Tenant Act. But I always argue that it, it is still a duty, just a general warranty of habitability. So, for example, most uh, housing and building codes don't talk about mold. 
they say things like, oh, you shouldn't have holes in the roof. You shouldn't have holes, cracks between the door. But it doesn't say what happens once, you know, if you already have that crack and now there's been a leak and, and there's mold in the unit, um, you know, you have a roach, roach or infestation. A lot of property building maintenance codes don't talk about those. Uh, so I always argue, well, even though, you know, first of all, there's no housing or building code. So even though it may be a safety material safety breach uh, or health violation, there's no building code that requires it. So I still argue under the general warranty of habitability, even though there's no specific building code on point, the landlord has the duty to fix those things. Uh, the tenant also has duties. Um, they have to comply with any housing building codes that apply to tenants. Um, I hate the language of this, but it says, keep the part of the premises that they occupy as clean and safe as the conditions permit. That's crazy. I mean, that, you know, that makes it sound like, you know, the landlord, the tenant shouldn't have any dirt on their floor because obviously they can clean it. They shouldn't have any dirty dishes in the sink. Uh, so the language is horrible. Uh, I've never had a landlord try to, you know, evict somebody for having dirty dishes in the sink, unless there's an infestation caused by that. But, uh, but the statutory language is very, very broad and and, and could be used potentially against tenants. Uh, tenants have to remove any trash from the property. Um, they have to keep all the plumbing fixtures as clean as they can. Uh, all the they have to maintain all the systems in the house uh, unless they break down. Then again, that's the duty of the landlord. Uh, they have to be responsible for any destruction that they, their, their guests, or their pets cause, and they can they should not disturb the quiet and peaceful enjoyment of other tenants. Uh, so it's very important to note this is a duty of the tenants, not of the landlord. Um, so there's always a question about whether a tenant can file, you know. So a tenant has a complaint about another tenant. They tell the landlord. The landlord doesn't do anything about the noise complaints. Does the first tenant that has the complaint have any? kind of cause of action against the second tenant to evict them. It's not exactly clear under the Landlord Tenant Act. Um, you know, it's not a duty of the landlord that they, um, there is the duty of quiet enjoyment, but that's a term of art, which means the landlord shouldn't be interrupting and just entering the, the property, not that they have a duty to evict other tenants that are being noisy. So uh, that, that problem does come up. There's no good answer in Kansas law that I've found on that issue. Um, uh, landlord is, can make other rules and regulations. Again, they can't. They can't be. Uh, you know, they can't be <laughs> by the Landlord Tenant Act. Uh, it has to be to promote the convenient, safety, peace, or welfare of the tenants, or to preserve the landlord's property from abusive use. Uh, it has to be reasonably related to the purpose for which it's adopted. Uh, the big one is it has to apply to all tenants equally. So landlords can't be making rules for some tenants that don't apply to other tenants. Uh, so that's a big one. Uh, we get landlords on that all the time. They say, "Oh, well, your client needs to do this." And I'll say, is that, a, is that a rule for all the tenants? No, well, then it's not enforceable against my clients. Uh, it has to be sufficiently clear about what the tenant needs to do or not do. Uh, it can't be, again, to avoid the duties of the landlord. It can't say, oh, tenants need to make all the plumbing repairs and fix all the AC appliances. Uh, the tenant has to have notice of it when they enter into the rental agreements. The landlord can't just be making changes. If you have a year lease, the landlord cannot make changes to that lease unless this next section uh, if there is a, if it's going to be a substantial modification, it's not enforceable against the tenant unless the tenant consents to it in writing. Uh, what the landlord can do if it's month to month, then they just need to give the, the tenant 30 days notice before the next rent paying date that that's going to affect next month. In that case, the tenant wouldn't have to sign off because that's a, that would be a new lease period. Um, but if you're in a year lease, the tenant uh, can't, uh, you know, it has to be signed in writing by the tenant for it to be enforced. The landlord does have the right to enter. Uh, it's actually a crazy statute. It says at, at reasonable times with reasonable notice in order to uh, make necessary agreed repairs. And then the second one is decorations. So apparently as long as the landlord gives you reasonable notice for, and come in at a reasonable time, they can come in and decorate your house for Halloween. Uh, uh, that's what the statute says. I've never seen that happen, uh, but that's, that's what it says. Uh, more often than, than that, we're gonna have these other issues, alterations, improvements, uh, necessary services, or they can, we have this question a lot, show it to potential purchasers, mortgagees, tenants, workmen, or contractors. People ask us all the time, does my landlord have the right? Do I have to let, you know, they're, they're trying to show it to new tenants. Do I have to let them in? Yes. As long as it's at a reasonable time and they give you reasonable notice, neither of those are defined under Kansas law, either statutes or case law. So as a general rule, we say, you know, probably at least 24 hours, obviously it'll depend on what it is. Um, if there's an emergency, then they can come in that would uh, involve potential loss of life or severe property damage. They can just come in. They don't have to give you notice. 
But other than that, uh, we just say as a general rule, 24 hours, but that is not um, a Kansas law. Uh, the landlord should not use that right to access in order to harass the tenant. Um, if the tenant refuses to allow them lawful access, uh, the landlord can get injunctive relief so they can go to court and the court can order them to allow them access. They can terminate the rental agreement. Uh, and there's no rule on how much time they have to give or if they have to give a 14, 30 day notice um, and they can obtain actual damages. So there's that term again, actual damages. Um, if the landlord is, if the landlord's using this to harass the tenant uh, or, you know, making unlawful entry, not giving notice, in, coming in at unreasonable times, the tenant can do the same thing. They can get injunctive relief, <laughs> they can terminate the rental agreement and they can recover actual damages. Um, if the tenant's going to be gone, uh, for more than seven days, uh, the landlord can require them, this has to be in the rental agreement, uh, to give the landlord notice that they're going to be gone for that long. I think the purpose of this is that, you know, the landlord may want to come in just to make sure that the, there's no leaks or anything like that. Uh, but if the tenant doesn't do that, the landlord can recover actual damages. Uh, if the tenant's gone for more than 30 days, the landlord can enter if reasonably necessary. If the tenant's 10 days late in rent or more and have removed, a, uh, sorry, if the, and then separately, if the tenant is 10 days more behind in uh, rent and they've removed a substantial portion of their belongings, the landlord can assume that they've abandoned the unit unless the tenant told them otherwise. In that case, they wouldn't need to file an eviction case. They could just hold, store the tenant's property for 30 days and do, follow that procedure, which I'll go into in a second. Um, and then they could uh, find a new tenant. Um, if the tenant abandons the dwelling unit, the landlord has to make reasonable efforts to rent it at fair rental value. Um, if they find a new tenant, then they can't charge the old tenant for the remainder of that lease term. But if you're in a year lease and you leave a month in and the landlord makes a good faith effort to try to find a new tenant and they can't, uh, then the first tenant that's left, uh, that's abandoned the property is responsible for that 11 months of rent while the landlord couldn't find a new tenant. Um, if the tenant leaves personal property at the dwelling, um, the landlord can uh, they have to store it and they can, can either store that on site or they can move that to a storage unit and then they can charge the, those, the reasonable fees to the tenant. Uh, before doing anything with it, they have to, uh, at least 15 days prior, they have to publish it in a newspaper general circulation. Um, they have to, within seven days, mail that application to the tenant's last known address. Again, if the tenant hasn't given a boarding address, that's just going to get mailed to the property uh, where the tenants left. And so they may never know what's happening. Um, and if they do that, the landlord can then sell or otherwise dispose of the property. They can sell it uh, and they're not responsible for any, they don't have to, they do sell it. They don't have to apply any of that money to what the tenant owes. They can keep all that money for themselves or they can just trash it. Um, they can charge the tenant reasonable fees for the removal, for the storage, for the sale. Um, and they can just tack it on to what the tenant owes. Uh, if the landlord accepts late rent uh, without reservation, um, then that waives their right to terminate the rental agreement for that breach. But what the landlord can do is they can accept late rent, uh, give usually some judges require that to be in writing, the statute doesn't. Uh, but what they would do is have a reservation of rights letter saying, I'm reserving my right, to, I'm accepting your late rent, but I'm reserving my right to evict you. And then they could still go forward with an eviction in that case. Um, so it might be worth it for the tenant to figure out whether the uh, uh, landlord's going to still evict them whether they pay late rent or not. But they can only do it if they specifically reserve the right to. Um, law for removal or diminished services. So if the, if the landlord has to go to court to evict somebody, unless the tenant abandons the property. Uh, but if they haven't abandoned the property, the landlord can't lock them out. They can't remove their stuff. They can't take off half the roof, well, which is what happened in one case uh, that there's case law on. Uh, and they also can't uh, willfully diminish the services. So they can't shut off your utilities. If they do those things, the tenant can sue for one and a half months rent or damages. So here's that place where I was talking about where the statutes don't use the term actual damages. They use the word damages. And there's case law that specifically says if this was done with malice, uh, the tenant can recover punitive damages or things like uh, pain and suffering, things that aren't actual, you know, actual uh, economic damages. Um, the landlord can't uh, retaliate and file an eviction or diminish services to a tenant. Uh, retaliation is very specifically defined under Kansas law as if the tenant has made a complaint to code enforcement, if they've made a complaint to the landlord about violations of their legal duties, or if they've joined a tenant union. Those are the only three things that are considered retaliation under Kansas law uh, for purposes of the statute. 
if the landlord does decrease the tenant services or if they try to evict them after one of these things, um, the, the tenant can again, it's the same, it, it cites that earlier statute. The tenant can sue for one and a half months rent or damages, not actual damages, any damages, whichever is greater. Um, and that's a defense in an action for possession if the landlord's trying to evict them. But uh, notwithstanding that section, the landlord can still increase the rent uh, as long as it doesn't conflict with the lease uh, and, it's, and it's in good faith. So, you know, there's a utility rate increase, property tax increase, uh, increase in the cost of operations, that sort of thing. And also notwithstanding uh, the earlier section, the landlord can still try to evict the tenant um, if the housing and building code violation was caused by the tenant, obviously the tenant, you know, crashed the place and caused the housing and building code, they can evict the tenant for that. Or this is the big one, if the tenant is in default of rent. Um, so Kansas law does not allow a tenant to withhold rent, even if the landlord is not making repairs. They're basically independent duties. Um, so never advise a client to withhold rent. The thing to do is to go to court, sue your landlord for injunctive relief to make them do the repairs, or you can give a 1430 to, to, to leave, which I'll cover in a little bit. If you want to leave, terminate your lease early, but do not withhold rent. If you do that, uh, even if the landlord is retaliating against you, they can still um, help to evict you. Um, or if the, if the repairs would cost, if they're so so big, so um, that the tenant would basically need to leave the property for the landlord to do it, then the landlord can evict the person, but the tenant still has a cause of action against them uh, for violation of their duties as a landlord. Um, there's a specific statute I won't go into great detail. If you are a survivor of domestic violence, um, you can break your lease early. So first of all, a landlord can't refuse to rent to you based on that fact. And also you can, as long as you give the, the landlord notice that you are a survivor, uh, you're not liable for rent. If you are, are a survivor and if you give notice to the landlord, um, then you can leave. The landlord can, can charge you up to one month termination if that's in the lease, but they cannot charge you any more rent than that. So if you're one month into a 12 month lease, you leave, they can charge you one more month, but they can't charge you for the additional 10 months for the remainder of that lease term. Um, they can require that you provide some proof you don't have to do this initially. You just have to give them a statement saying that you're a survivor and you're protected and you're leaving, you know, on what date uh, or you've already left on what you left. But they can require that you get a note from a medical professional that they have to sign under penalty of perjury um, saying that they believe that you're a protected person. Or if you get a court order, any kind of court order, it doesn't have to be specifically in a protection order case. It could be in a criminal case where there's bond conditions. Um, it could be potentially in a divorce case or a paternity case if you have some sort of order, uh, basically saying that, that, that you're a protected person, um, then that would qualify and you wouldn't need to get a statement from a medical professional. Um, so if the landlord material fails to comply with their duties, you can send them a 1430, which says you have 14 days to fix this issue. If you don't fix it within 14 days, I'm terminating the lease um, 30 days away. And, and that the tenants, the 1430 has to be tied to a rental period. Um, so right now it's the 18th of the month, assuming they pay their rent on the first of the month, since we don't have 30 days before June 1st, the tenant would give 14 days. You have 14 days from today to fix the issue. If not, I'm terminating the rental agreement on July 1st. Um, or, in or in addition and or, uh, the tenant can sue the landlord for damages or obtain adjunct, adjunct, uh, uh, sorry, injunctive relief or do any of those things, all of those things. Um, the habitability, so that's for material non-compliance. If it's substantially impaired, if there's some kind of damage that's substantially, usually it's by fire, uh, destruction by fire or casualty, the tenant can leave the property uh, within five days, give written notice to the landlord saying that they left and that they're terminating the, the rental agreement or they can move into whichever parts of the, of the property are still usable and they pay prorated rent for just the amounts that are usable. So let's say you have three bedrooms, now you can only use one, then maybe you only have to pay a third. There's no, there's no good definition of what the, how to figure out that prorated amount. Um, but so let's say you can use half the unit and you only pay half the rent, for example. Um, if the landlord has uh, breached their duties of the landlord or the general warranty of habitability, you could sue them for the difference between the fair rental value uh, as it actually is versus as it should have been. And so that's from a case called Love versus Monarch Apartments. Uh, any, you know, you can get consequential damages if they, you know, if they are reasonable and they, they stem from the breach. Um, and if it's, you know, for malice, fraud, or want disregard for the rights of the tenant, you can get punitive damages. 
Uh, if the tenant, similarly, if the tenant fails to comply with the lease materially, uh, the landlord can give them a 1430. The big difference is the landlord's 1430 does not have to be tied to a rental period. So if they, they give you, four, let's say they give you a notice today, you have 15 days from today to fix the issue. Uh, if you don't do that, then in 30 days from today, not July 1st, like a tenant has to do, 30 days from today, the rental agreement terminates. Uh, so it's a little nonsense that the, that the landlord doesn't have to be tied to a rental period, but that's the current state of uh, Kansas law. Uh, also, if you have failed to pay rent, the landlord can give you a three-day notice and you have three days to pay that rent. But if you don't pay that within three days, then they can file uh, file to evict you. Uh, and the landlord can also get damages or injunctive relief against the tenant. Um, if you want to terminate a month to month tenancy, either side can give 30 days notice. And in this case, both of them have to be tied to a rental period, both the landlord's notice and the tenant's notice. So assuming again, your rental payment date is on the first, um, either the landlord or the tenant give notice that they're terminating the rental agreement on July 1st. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the landlords a lot of times mess this up. A lot of times they will actually try to terminate the rental agreement a day before. Uh, and there is case law that says, because this is a statutory remedy, strict compliance with the statutes are required. Um, and so if the landlord tries to terminate a day early, if they try to terminate on the 30th or the 31st of the month instead of the first, which is the rent paying date, um, then, then you should be able to get that case thrown out. Some judges do that, some don't, um, but case law does say strict compliance. If the tenant's in the military and they have to leave due to military orders, um, then they only need to give 15 day notice to terminate a month to month tenancy. But if they're in a lease term, then they may still be responsible. They can't get out just because of the military. So it may be beneficial if you have military clients to try to be in month to month tenancies instead of your long leases, for example. Um, so if the tenant's still you know, in the property after that, then the landlord can fall to a victim. Um, if the tenant's holdover is willful and not in good faith, they can sue for one and a half months rent um, and one and a half times um, their, or one and a half times their actual damages, whichever is greater. So, but it's got to be in bad faith. It can't just be the tenant's got no money. They have nowhere to move. Uh, it's got to be in bad faith. The tenant has to say, hey, landlord, I hate you. I'm staying in this property just to screw you over. Uh, in that case, the landlord could probably get that one and a half times rent. Um, or notice to leave before the so in addition so those are the ways to terminate a tenancy either 1430 for material breach of the lease uh three-day notice for non-payment of rent or 30-day notice to terminate a month-to-month -month tenancy in addition to terminating the tenancy the landlord also has to send a notice to the tenant to leave the property and it doesn't have to use that exact term it can, most landlords say uh surrender or quit or vacate uh or it can use the word leave but it has to both terminate the tenancy and ask the tenant to leave uh, th those notices can be combined together. It doesn't have to be two separate notices, uh, but the notice to leave has to be delivered at least three days before um, filing for an eviction case. It can be left with anybody that lives in the property that's over 12. Uh, that's over 12. Um, and it's three 24 hour periods. It's not three days. So normally when you count time in Kansas, today's the 18th. So you'd have the 19th, 20th, 21st, and they wouldn't be able to file until the 22nd. But if a landlord gave you notice today at 8 a.m., then they could file at 8.01 a.m. On, uh, on the 21st instead of on the 22nd. So just be, be aware that it's 24 hour periods and not three days. Um, then there's some case law and notices. So again, it has to be strictly pursued. So they mess it up at all. You should hopefully be able to get a case thrown out. Um, so how cases in, in Kansas usually go is the landlord gives the notice. Again, it has to be both a notice to terminate the tenancy and notice to leave. Uh, if they don't, they either don't comply, don't pay within three days, don't fix the issues within 14 days or don't leave, then the landlord can file uh, an unlawful detainer or an eviction case in court. Uh, the, the tenant will receive a summons to receive to appear at the first hearing, which is called an answer hearing within three to 14 days after the filing. Um, the tenant shall either appear personally or by counsel, or they can file a written answer before the answer hearing. If the tenant is not going to appear, I highly, and they're going to file a written answer instead, I highly recommend that they call the court, let them know that they filed a written answer, they're not appearing, because I have had some courts issue default judgments against tenants that have filed a written answer and not appeared at the answer. So always let the court know uh, that's what you're going to do. You can, you should be able to get that case set aside, which we have, but it's just a pain to get it done. And in the meantime, the tenant might actually be evicted before you can get that done. Um, so if the tenant appears and they deny the allegations of the petition, then there'll be a trial set within 14 days. 
Um, but there are some potential affirmative defenses and then they'll have to, some courts require tenants to file a written answer, some don't. Uh, some courts require only a written uh, counterclaim. So if the tenant has any counterclaims, it has to be in writing. Uh, but it's always best to just put it in writing, file the answer and counterclaim. Um, I'm not going to go over these because I'm pressed for time. But these are just some potential affirmative defenses. Um, if it's a non-payment of rent case where possession is an issue, the, land, the tenant has to counterclaim or they've waived those counterclaims forever. So if it's a non-payment of rent case where possession is an issue, the tenant must file a counterclaim. It's compulsory. Um, if the tenant wins more money than the landlord's asking for rent, then the court can. This is the only time where you can maybe not pay rent um, and still get possession of the property, but it's got to be done in court. There's no law that says this, but just as if no rent remains due after applying the counterclaim, judgment may be entered for the tenant. A lot of times judges don't want to do that. They don't want to make people stay in contracts where they don't like each other. Um, so judges could just decide to evict your client anyway, even if, they, even if they're the ones that are owed the net amount um, after their counterclaim. So uh, it's always best if your client has the ability and means to move out to, to ask them to do so. Uh, obviously, for our clients, it's not always going to be possible. Uh, here's some potential counterclaims that you can bring up. Again, we'll send this presentation out so you can take a look at those. Uh, if your client wants to get a continuance, so if you're the defendant, um, you have to, in general, the normal rule requires that you put a bond up for all damages and rent that you may owe the landlord. But um, going back to that statute, the, the compulsory counterclaim and non-payment of rent stat in cases with possessions at issue, that says the court may order the tenant to pay rent into the court. Um, and so I always argue, look, that's the more specific statute that only applies in non-payment of rent cases where possessions at issue, not just all, all evictions. Um, so my, tenant my client should only have to put up the rent and not have to put up a bond for all of the rent and damage that may accrue. They should just be allowed to pay monthly rent into the court. And so I've had that work in some courts. Um, after a court case is done, if the tenant loses, the landlord will file a journal entry and writ of restitution. That will go to the sheriff. The sheriff will have a maximum of 14 days to remove that person. I always tell people it's going to be, it could be immediately. Uh, more often it's closer to seven to 10 days, but the maximum is 14 days. If the tenant still has personal property left over, uh, if, the, if they still have personal property, when the landlord has the duty to store it, uh, but they don't have to release that personal property to the tenant unless the tenant pays all of the judgment amount plus reasonable storage and removal fees. Um, so if the tenant has the means, if they lose at the ev eviction court, it's very, very important that they try to uh, um, get, that, uh, get their stuff out. There's, you know, especially anything that's sentimental or valuable. Uh, you can get a default set aside. Um, you can get a, you can do a modification of judgment, either a new trial, alter amended judgment, or for relief from judgment. The landlord, uh, uh, sorry, the eviction statutes in limited actions cite to the uh, civil statutes on those. Um, some special issues are mold and infestations, getting mold testing. Uh, tenants aren't experts in mold, so you probably need to have an expert come testify or the judge may throw out that evidence. High utility bills, you know, is that the responsibility of the tenant or the landlord? You know, it might depend on if there's problems unit that the landlord is responsible for, high late fees, you know, about whether it's a penalty or liquidated damages provision, um, code enforcement inspection reports, obviously those are hearsay unless you either do a subpoena or have that code inspector come test in court, and then discovery. Uh, by, by statute, cases have to go to trial within 28 days. Uh, a request for production of documents takes 30 days, so there's no possible way to get a request for production of documents done in the time that a, a, a eviction case goes to trial. So just some, some issues that we've got with evictions that we, you know, some of them we don't have great answers. All right, All that's right. my eviction I, stuff. I think, Matt, you have a question? Before we get into foreclosure. Uh, I think you're muted, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I cannot, you wanna put it in the chat? Oh shoot, oh, oh wait, okay, hold, hold on. Make sure my volume's up. All right, sit, I think my volume's down. Try it again, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes, got it. All right. Okay. Uh, two, two, two anecdotes that might be useful or helpful to the larger group. One is um, I met a woman who had been evicted and had a judgment against her. And um, we learned that to get aid, to get charitable support for paying off her judgment, uh, they needed to have a, uh, they need to have a picture of the eviction notice itself. And um, of course she had, she moved out, she didn't have it. Um, 
she couldn't find it. And the landlord, when requested, uh, they were generally helpful, but they didn't have a copy of the notice itself. So <clears throat> that was, um, yeah, I just, um, I had, I had uh, my paralegal prepare a document and I will circulate this uh, at a later time, but there were a number of things that we ran into that we didn't expect to find. And that was one of them. So uh, it's real important to take a picture of the eviction notice or ideally even have a paper copy of it because without that, they, there may be some obstacles that, um, uh, that they'll, you'll encounter that are and frustrating. To add to um, that, your, your client should just have a folder with all of their, so they should have their lease, their move-in checklist, any notices, any correspondence they get from the landlord, they should be keeping all that stuff. Pictures are great though. If they don't want to keep a copy, they should at least, yeah, they should, they should keep copies of everything or at least take pictures of everything. Thank you, Pat. But yeah, and the, sec and, and the second thing was, um, uh, Vanessa, my paralegal, made a ton of calls and found that Metro Lutheran Ministry was um, was helpful in getting this uh, judgment uh, paid. And she has a contact, and I'll put that in a, in a, in a larger document. The main contact there was very hard to get. But once she found her, um, her name was Kristen Olson. Uh, she was very helpful in getting this judgment satisfied. So um, even though we were late to the party, she had been evicted and had a judgment, we were able to navigate um, a pathway for her to get the judgment um, satisfied um, and, and uh, get a fresh start. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, if, if you do interact with uh, a tenant before they've been evicted, and I haven't had a lot of experience with this, but I did have some experience where I called Evans and Molinex was the, the uh, landlord's attorney and uh, an attorney there named Steve Gatzolas or something like that. He was super helpful. He gave our client another two weeks to basically stay there. Now they had to pay, but basically it gave them an opportunity to get their act together and to leave on their own terms. It, this was right around Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, I was surprised at the civility and professionalism that they extended to me. Um, now, again, the, the client had to pay what was, I think, I think they, they took a little bit of a haircut, but they were, you know, Steve was so pleased to have an attorney on the other side he could deal with to negotiate uh, a peaceful wrap up of this. And um, um, we had to go to court, and state everything on the record, but Obviously, this family was thrilled that they were able to leave after Thanksgiving. Uh, they had to dot all their I's and cross their T's, of course, but uh, it was a win-win for the landlord and a win-win for um, uh, the tenant. And uh, I felt that it was a very good experience all in all. So that's all I was going to say. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, good. several good points in there. So one I want to specifically highlight is so there are all sorts of rental assistance organizations out there. Wyandotte County specifically three off the top of my head are Metro Lutheran Ministries, which Matt mentioned, Avenue of Life, Cross Lines. Uh, and then also there's the Kansas Emergency Rental Assistance Program done through the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. Uh, so that's a great one to call. Uh, and then also just in general, if you're looking for resources in any county, uh, 211 is the number for the United Way. And they know resources in all the counties, not just on housing or rental, but on all sorts of issues. So if you, if you do need uh, any kind of assistance for your clients, the United Way 211 number is great. But but what, what I would add is, as we learned, you give them these numbers and it it, it's, it, it can be a black hole of, of you know, uh, you, you, you know, it's very difficult to get somebody res who's responsive. And it would be nice for us to develop a cheat sheet that you call this direct dial number and speak to this woman, or better yet, we could do it. And... Uh, I think that's a much more satisfying way of helping them navigate this because they're obviously traumatized in the case of this client that we represented, she was living out of her car. Um, so um, I think we need to do as much as we can to short circuit some of these general numbers so that they can get right to the person who can help them the most. Perfect. Yeah, so advocacy goes farther than just taking cases to court. So thank you, Matt. Um, all right, now I've got a little less than 15 minutes to cover mortgage foreclosure law in Kansas, so I'm going to fly through this even faster than I did evictions. 
Um, so here we go. Um, some applicable statutes. So there are real and uh, personal and real property laws, chapter 58. Um, and there's on townhouses, mortgages, townhouses, manufactured housing, which formerly were called mobile homes. Uh, and then on, on uh, Kansas Uniform Common Interest, which is about homeowners associations, condos, and cooperatives. Uh, obviously, these are all governed by Chapter 60 in Civil Procedure, uh, and then also the Uniform Commercial Code, Chapter 84. Uh, so, and then, um, so I just cited the statute. Most of you probably already know these, but the defenses and objections statute. Just make sure when you're filing an answer that you're following these. You have 21 days to file an answer. Um, you can get a clerk's extension. So we make, this is a part of our regular practice is that if you file this before the answer's due, you can just get an automatic 14 days. It doesn't even have to go to the judge. Uh, have a link to the form on our website. We can just file in it. So this only applies in civil cases, not in limited actions cases. So you can't do this in an eviction, for example. Um, but this is again, just the statute on how to, uh, these are just some common defenses, the 12, you know, the 12B defenses, obviously make sure you're looking at those. Uh, most of these won't apply, but service can be an issue. Uh, failure to join a party can be an issue in foreclosure cases. So just be thinking about uh, the, just the general defenses that might apply. Um, so when you're answering, if, you know, I like to go paragraph by paragraph. Some, some attorneys will just go, I admit one through one, five, eight, nine, and I deny two, eight, nine. And, well, I said eight for both of them, but you know, you can figure that out. Uh, but the statute requires that if you're going to deny an allegation, you must fairly respond to the substance. So you, we shouldn't be doing that. It might be fine in limited actions court, but in civil court, if you're denying an allegation, you need to specifically say why. And if you don't know the answer, say that. You can say, you know, lacks knowledge or information. That acts as the denial. So I always use that. And I think that's very helpful to avoid judgment on the pleadings is to deny the things that your client wasn't there for. So for example, they always say, that the, that the you know, plaintiff is duly organized under Kansas law or national law, wherever. We don't know that. We weren't there when they did their articles of incorporation. They probably are, but we can deny it. We can say we lack information uh, and then they need to prove that. Now that's a fact, you know, that's a factor in the case that they may need to prove. Uh, so which hopefully would preclude judgment on the pleadings. And then they would have to instead do a motion for summary judgment, having an affidavit, you know, or proof that they're, you know, duly organized. Also, if it has anything to do with unknown spouses or unknown tenants or unknown uh, you know, people living there. Your client can say they lack information. I don't know of anybody hiding out in my attic. Maybe there's somebody there. I haven't gone and looked. Uh, but so if it's anything that, so, and then also the third one that I regularly just say I deny information is that it was recorded with the register of deeds. So there's a stamp on there, but your client wasn't there when they took that to the record of deeds. Uh, they don't know that that's actually a, an illegitimate stamp. So you can say they lack knowledge or information, make them prove that. Um, so and then that, kind of goes into what I was just talking about. Um, if you failed to deny something, you've admitted it. And if you don't put any facts about why you're denying it, you might be admitting it as well. So just make sure you're doing that. Um, these are just some of the affirmative defenses. Not all of these are going to apply. The big ones for us are going to be, uh, you know, in satisfaction. We made a new deal. They said, you know, I did a forbearance agreement. I made my payment under that forbearance agreement. They said they would reinstate my mortgage and they didn't. Uh, or estoppel, you know, promissory estoppel is an exception to the statute of frauds. So even though your contract for for you know must be in writing for real property, uh, if, if people if the loan servicers are making promises to you, um, you can you know you can try to hold them to that if, if you don't have it in writing or if you don't have a recorded phone call, it's going to be difficult. Uh, that's just some things we should be thinking about in our um, foreclosure cases. Um, counterclaims and cross claims. Uh, so there you know there's compulsory counterclaims if it arises out of the same transaction or occurrence. Um, so just make make sure that if your client has any defense or any counterclaims that you're bringing those in the case so they might be waived. Um, one of the things that we one of the things that I argue fairly regularly is the usury rate. So now, um, as of 2013, the usury rate is a flat 15 percent. Below 15 percent, it's not considered usury in Kansas. But prior to July of 2013, um, they used to have specific interest rates that were mapped to I think it was the prime rate. Um, so these are, if you go to the Secretary of State's website, they have those. If you have a mortgage that was from June of 2013 or earlier, make sure you look at the interest rate in that mortgage. And then you go to the uh, Secretary of State's website, look at the serious interest rate. So for example, if it was in June, you know, June, let's, I'm going to call it 5% to make it easy. If they had a 6% interest rate in your mortgage, you can deduct that 1% they were over. And then you get to deduct that again as a penalty. So I had one 
where the mortgage rate was so much higher than the than the usury rate that they actually had a negative interest rate. So I argued that the landlord uh, or that sorry that the mortgager um, owed owed my client money. It's a negative interest rate. They were so were so usurious uh, that they actually owed my client money. Um, the Kansas Consumer Protection Act can absolutely apply in in uh, some of these cases. Uh, there's an argument I've had national banks uh, argue that it doesn't apply to them due to an exception, but I would try to always bring these claims if you can. Uh, if you get an issue like that with a national bank that's bringing the foreclosure, let me know. We can look into that. Um, basically, it's deceptive and unconscionable acts. Uh, one of the common ones is a disclaimer of warranties where they just say, oh, we're selling this as is. Um, you cannot, uh, under the Kansas Consumer Protection Act, disclaim the implied warranty of merchantability uh, or the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. So if you say, oh, if they tell you this house is great, you can have your small business here, but then there's an HOA fee that says, you know, an HOA provision that says you can't do that. Um, that could be an unconscionable act or, or a deceptive act of practice. Um, if they do that, it can be a $1,000 civil penalty and you can get attorney fees. So just definitely something to be thinking about. Also, there's federal uh, unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices. So make sure you look at federal law to see if it does. If it doesn't qualify under Kansas Consumer Protection Act, it may fall, uh, qualify under federal law. Uh, Reg X, RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, um, is uh, you know a federal code of regulations. Um, it applies to mortgages or origination, title insurance, uh, settling uh, settlements. Um, and mainly it covers kickbacks. They can't be doing kickbacks and then mortgage origination and servicing documents. Those are the main things that it covers. Um, and it's just basically they can't do kickbacks. They have to be, you know, on the up and up with you. Um, and it also applies in loss mitigation support. The Truth and Lending Act. So this is the act that uh, all of these cover multiple things. So just, these are things just you be uh, having in the back of your mind to be thinking about if you get a mortgage foreclosure case. TILA is the act that says that they have to um, give the consumer the actual cost of what the loan's going to be. So, oh yeah, here's the interest rate, one percent. But once you add in all the closing fees and all that, it's actually going to be five percent. Uh, if they don't let you know that the APR, um, then, then that could be a violation. Uh, you have rescission rights within a certain amount of time to rescind the agreement. Um, and so these are things to be thinking about. These are just big federal acts that may apply to your mortgage cases. Um, ability to repay as of I believe it's 2012 or 2013 uh, when. Uh, mortgage companies are giving out mortgages. They have to make a determination uh, of the person's ability to pay. So they had this huge crash in 2008 where if they were just giving mortgages to anybody, they didn't care if they could repay them. You know? uh, so now they can't do that. They have to make sure that they, they think the uh, you know client, that your client has the ability to repay. If they don't do that, that could be a violation of regulation. Uh, equal Credit Opportunity App can't be you know discriminating against people when giving credit. Um, the Fair Housing Act, they can't discriminate against people, um, you know, on where they live. They can't be saying, oh, you know, you're this race or you're this gender. You should live in this neighborhood and not this neighborhood. They shouldn't be doing anything like that. And so keep in mind, there's a difference between federal law. All these regulations have differences in what uh, are protected categories. So, for example, the Fair Housing Act um, includes gender identity and sexual orientation, whereas Kansas law does not. Uh, so there was an executive order in Kansas law, but I'm pretty sure that got rescinded. Uh, so just be careful that they do uh, they do have different uh, definitions of what the protected classes are. Um, splitting the note from the mortgage. Um, so in general, um, you know, the mortgage and the note gets sold together. So you you uh, endorse the note over to the next company. You assign the mortgage over to the next company, and, and you register that with Register of Deeds. But every once in a while, one or the other of those things doesn't get done. There's this case in Kansas that says if you split the note from the mortgage, that they may both be unenforceable. So if you you know if the company has the note, they can probably still get the money from you, but they can't foreclose on your house, so they can't get it out of the house. They can get a judgment against you for the money. Um, that they can fix that, but that just may be a good defense in a foreclosure that can buy you some time to get your client, you know, one of these new programs, uh, get them some money and, and try to get their loan reinstated. Um, HTCI has this great foreclosure timeline uh, that kind of goes into just this is just a general timeline. Obviously, court cases can go nuts. Um, and they can be wild, wildly differ on the timeline. This is just a general uh, timeline of how foreclosure cases goes. Um, under Reg X, one of the things that they're supposed to do is that if you're in foreclosure, they're supposed to give you a single point of contact. And so the rule is called the continuity of contact rule. Um, and so they're supposed to give you either one person or one group of people that you can call with a direct 
you know, a, some direct uh, contact information. If they don't do that, um, you know, that could be a violation of the continuity of contact rule. In addition to that, dual tracking. So if your client gives a completed loss mitigation application, so loss mitigation is saying, I've fallen behind on my mortgage. I neither, you know, I, I would like to for, do forbearance where I don't pay for a few months or reinstatement where I pay the, you know, pay what I owe and I just get back on my normal mortgage payments or loan modification where I say, I can't afford this going forward. I've lost my job. I'd like to pay a less, lesser amount and extend my loan over you know, a further amount of time. If they've done a loss mitigation application, they've completed it, then the landlord is not allowed to continue forward. Uh, sorry, not the landlord. The uh, mortgage company is not allowed to go forward on the foreclosure case. It can also potentially stop a mortgage sale from going through as long as it's done uh, within enough time before um, the uh, sale is set for. And yes, so it's 37 days. So as long as you get the completed loss mitigation application, at least 37 days in before the foreclosure sale, that can stop the foreclosure sale. And then they may need to redo it, you know, do a new three uh, three months of publication, reset the sale, and that sort of thing. So loss mitigation is a huge um, option. Uh, and so these, so every company calls it something different. So they can call it loss mitigation is what the statutes call it. Some, some call it foreclosure prevention. Um, some call it borrower assistance programs. Uh, so the general term is loss mitigation, but your mortgage servicer may have a different term for it. Uh, HCCI also puts out this list, which just has some of the most common uh, foreclosure prevention or loss mitigation options. And I'll go over those really briefly. A uh, reinstatement or repayment plan. So if your client can pay the amount that they're behind, they can just pay the amount that they're owed and then just reinstate the mortgage and continue forward on their normal payment. Um, if they have an FHA loan, a Federal Housing Administration, uh, then it's possible that they could do partial mortgage insurance or, uh, or so what this is, is that they would take the amounts that are due, the principal and interest, um, and they can tack those onto a second, basically a second mortgage at the end of the loan, but that second mortgage has no interest. It's not interest bearing. So once the once your client pays off their first mortgage, then they would start paying on the partial claim um, and they would only have to pay that and there was no interest. So that's a great option if they have an FHA loan or private servicers can have a similar option. They may call it something different. Most don't, but it, it's definitely possible to come to. Um, forbearance agreement. So this is if you're just your client loses their job and they can't pay for a few months. Um, you know they can. But that that would be deferment. So they can defer it for a few months. A forbearance agreement says, look, hey, uh, they want to make sure that you can pay going forward. So they're going to give you three payments. As long as you make those three payments, uh, then they'll reinstate your mortgage or do or at that point do a loan modification where they uh, try to refinance it basically. Um, so that's a mortgage modification. So this is generally, let's, pay, let's say you have a 30-year mortgage, you paid 10 years off, you know, you were paying $1,000 a month on it, um, and you can't afford to pay that amount anymore. They can modify your loan to extend your loan now instead of paying 20 years, you're paying 30 years again, but that lowers your payments to $800 a month instead of 1000 So that might be more affordable for your client. Um, so in addition to a mortgage modification, a, a modification is done through the loan servicer that you currently have. You can also try to refinance through another company. So if your client's got good enough credit, they might be able to just go to a third, you know, a, another mortgage company, have that mortgage company pay off the first mortgage company and just get a loan through them. Um, loan assumption. So that, that would be the refinance, basically where you get somebody else to assume the mortgage and, or it could be, you know, if you can find a co-borrower or somebody that would assume the mortgage for you, if you've got really good friends and family, uh, that's a possibility. Usually not a great option for that other person, but it's could be a good option for your client. Um, those are all the options or the general options to keep your house. There's also options if you can't if you can't afford any of those things or you don't have the credit or, or, or if you just can't afford your mortgage even if it gets modified. Uh, pre foreclosure or short sale. So this is if you owe more money um, than the house is worth, you can do a short sale where the lender would agree to just take the you know the, you can only sell it for you owe 120 thousand. But it's only worth a hundred thousand. You sell it for a hundred thousand. They agree to waive any deficiency. Very important uh, details on that are that a lot of loan, loan servicers require that you have tried to sell the house. So one of the first things I always advise my clients to do is talk to a real estate agent and at least consider putting it on the market because it may re be required for a lender to do a short sale. The other thing is too, there may be tax consequences of that. If the if the if the loan servicer uh, and I know I'm going over my time and I'm almost done. Uh, if the loan servicer uh, disclaims twenty thousand dollars, they're probably going to send you a ten ninety nine C, and you're going to 
have to claim that $20,000 as income and pay taxes on it. Um, so that's very important to remember. In lieu of foreclosure, this is where you just say, look, I, I can't afford this anymore. You just deed it back to the mortgage company and they decide not to foreclose. Uh, two important things about short sales and deed and lose is those still affect your client's credit. They will take a hit on their credit, but they're not as bad as what a foreclosure would be. Uh, reverse mortgage. So if your client's over 62 and they have equity in the house, uh, um, and they could get a reverse mortgage where, you're, where the servicer either pays them monthly or um, pays them a lump sum. Very, very important factor on this is they do not get to keep the house and their heirs their heirs do not get to keep the house it will go back to the bank when that person either dies or can't live in the house anymore goes into a nursing home for example um foreclosure prevention programs so depending on the type of loan if it's a fairly back loan uh there's all these options in kansas specifically there's now the kansas homeowner assistance fund uh, run by the kansas housing uh corporation so make sure your clients are applying for that. That'll cover up to $35,000 of their mortgage, up to $10,000 of their homeowners, insurance, utilities, taxes. Um, sheriff sales. So after a foreclosure uh, gets sold to the sheriffs, uh, the clients, uh, they have to publish for three weeks and then they'll do a sheriff sale at the courthouse. Uh, your clients can redeem the property. If they paid less than a third of the mortgage, they have three months to do that. They have to come up with the full price of the sheriff sale plus uh, any taxes. Uh, or fees that the buyer has paid. Uh, if they paid over a third of the mortgage or more, they get a year to do that. And during that time, they get to stay in the house. Um, if they're not out by the end of that year, uh, then whoever bought the property will have to file, a, not a full eviction action, but basically a writ to have the sheriff remove them. And if they're stuck, they have still a personal property in, in the unit after that, then it, it, it's, a, it's a huge pain. So um, that is the end of my presentation. I apologize for keeping you over. Um, feel free to leave now if you want to. I am available for questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions they want to ask, and the chat apparently was going nuts. Um, so yeah, so feel free to leave. The presentation is over. I appreciate you all uh, coming. But uh, um, let you me see one one comment I might add on on the reverse mortgages. Just a, a cautionary statement: um, if your client does take out a reverse mortgage, they're still obligated to pay insurance and uh, taxes. And if they don't do that, then they may end up losing it anyway. So make sure they're aware of that and that's something they can afford. Yeah, very, very important point. And the other thing too is that some mortgage servicers, and so Alex English in our office had this happen. Some mortgage servicers for the reverse mortgage will send you your clients out a notice asking you to confirm that you still live there. And if you don't respond to that, they may file a foreclosure case against you saying you don't live in the house anymore. Uh, we're going to file foreclosure. So Alex had a hell of a time proving that our clients still lived in this property. Our person was on oxygen, so they had a hard time making it to court. But we we told them, we're like, look, our, our client still lives there. And they're like, well, they didn't answer the thing, so they filed a foreclosure case. Uh, and so eventually got it dismissed, but it's just, you know, that was a pain. So so do be aware of that too. So um, I, I, look I, I, I put this in the chat, but you can just ignore the chat. So when, when you know, I had a client come into the clinic, they were in foreclosure, she and the husband, uh, were in the process of, of splitting. She had not yet filed a uh, divorce petition. Um, and I remember walking down the clinic and talking to Michael Hillary about it. And he said something that I really didn't appreciate, that the divorce judge would have the power to reform or change the terms of the mortgage and the responsibilities of the parties. Is that so yes and no. They can they can absolutely change the responsibility of the parties. But an important note there is that the mortgage company is not a party, so they can order the husband to pay it or the wife to pay it. But that doesn't bind the mortgage company. So if the husband's ordered to pay it, you, so usually what happens in a divorce case is if one party wants to keep the property, the judge orders that person to refinance it in their own name. It doesn't always happen. That's the problem. And so, and a lot of times the mortgage company doesn't want to let the other person off the hook. They want to be able to go after both of them. Um, so if the person, if the, the person ordered to do it doesn't have the credit to do it, the mortgage company may not let them. So there's a court order in divorce court saying that that person is responsible. But when they file it, when that person stops paying and the, and the mortgage company files a foreclosure, they're at, they're naming both parties. So your client, let's say, let's just say the husband is the one that wants to keep the house refinances in his name. And the wife is the one that wants to be off of it. Mortgage company, you know, husband stops paying, never refinanced it. Um, 
they then they, so then he stops paying and they file a foreclosure case they add wife white and she let's say they start you know they get a foreclosure judgment there's a deficiency and wife has to pay that wife can go back to divorce court and seek indemnification from the husband but it but the order of the divorce court is not binding on that mortgage company they can go after both parties unless the mortgage gets refined you know the note and the mortgage get refinanced in one person well does, does filing a divorce uh, does that act as any kind of stay on the foreclosure it does not, unfortunately, that would be great. The only stay I know of is in bankruptcy. So if the parties file bankruptcy, there's an automatic stay for all collection actions, which include for foreclosures. And you could ask, I mean, it's not an automatic thing, but you could absolutely go to the foreclosure court judge and say, hey, look, we're in divorce. We don't know who's going to be assigned. Can we hold off this foreclosure? Um, but that's up to the foreclosure judge to decide whether they would grant that or not. Okay. And that, that's my, I want to say that's, that's my fault. I apologize for not. I think I probably gave you like the, the quick answer, not the complete answer. And that's that's definitely on, on me. So, yeah. I mean, it is true that the judge can assign assign the debt to one part or the other. It's just not binding on the mortgage shopping. So, uh, uh, let's see, you got a question in the chat. It says, the person due to COVID got their mortgage redone and the rate is higher than the original. Is rate controlled by the usury rate allowed now or when they originally got their mortgage? If they do a refinance, then the current mortgage rates are what's going to apply. So rates are going up. So if they're going to do a refinance now, or if they're going to do a loan modification, then the, then it, it potentially could be charging a higher, if you know if they got a good rate on their original mortgage, could be a higher interest rate. But hopefully what's going to happen, and so, you, so usually most loan servicers have a rule, and each loan servicer is different. That, so the last mortgage company I dealt with, for example, said, uh, we won't let do a loan modification unless it's going to reduce your principal and interest payment by 10% or more. Um, so, so they calculate, you know, so you take the 20, you've already paid 10 years, you got 20 years left, they refinance that over a new 30 year mortgage. If that payment's not going to be a 10% reduction, and so that would include whatever the new interest rate is, you know, you had an interest rate at 4%, now it's going to be 6%. Um, if that new interest rate is going to be higher, that's factored into whether it's gonna be a 10% reduction or not. And if it's not, if it won't reduce your payments by 10%, they say, nope, you're not eligible for a loan modification. So good question. Um, yeah, Matt asked about the divorce. I think we covered that. All right, I think that's it. Unless anybody has any other questions they wanna ask. Well, I, I just wanna add that in, in, in Michael Hillary's, in fairness to him, in that case I was describing, the husband was living in the house and he he had the domain of the house and the wife wasn't living there at all. She had no interest at all. I mean, it, the equities were ones where it seemed like he would want to, uh, you know, take ownership and be responsible for the house as part of the divorce decree. Yeah. And usually, so what you should do in general in a divorce, obviously this doesn't apply to everything, but in general, if one party does, you should try to get that done before the divorce case is finalized. Try to get the refinance done or whatever you're going to do with the house. Because if that person doesn't qualify, then the best thing to do is to sell it and split the equity, if any, or split the debt, you know, split the deficiency if, if they owe money. Because what you, that's exactly what you don't want to have happen. If one person was ordered to do it. They can't do it for whatever, can't or don't do it for whatever reason. And now your client's on the hook years later for, and then they have to go back. They have to go, not only go to foreclosure court and, you know, which they don't don't really have a defense. They're on if they're on the note mortgage, they're going to owe that payment. Uh, then they have to go back to divorce court, try to get try to get a new judgment saying that the husband owes them. You know they they got they got garnished. The husband owes them. They should have to pay it. And then and then they may have to garnish the husband for the money. And if the husband has no money, then they just may be on the hook. And so try to get that stuff done before your divorce case gets finalized, if at all possible. Uh, and then we got one more. Uh, individual put down a down payment, made payments on the house for three years. Uh, house sold for higher than the mortgage. Is the individual entitled to the difference or can the mortgage company keep the excess? House was sold pursuant to a foreclosure. So that's a very important point. After a foreclosure sale, your client is entitled to either the surplus or the deficiency. Um, so if there's a surplus, yes, your client is entitled to do that. They need to file something in court. There's no specific document that we have on that, but probably you would need an order to pay. So if, if your client owes $100,000 left on their mortgage, um, but the house sells for $150,000 at auction, they should get that $50,000 extra, uh, so the surplus. But if there's a deficiency, sells for $100,000, but they owe $150,000, they owe still $50,000. And they, they don't have their house, and now they still owe the mortgage company $50,000. So uh, worst of both worlds. So 
Um, yes, I think, yeah, Michael, we are recording it. So I think we can probably get that sent out to everybody. I will double check on that. But. All right. Thank you all. I apologize for keeping everybody over. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to call or email. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.